Hello, welcome back. My name is Robert. If this is your first time coming to watch one of these videos, then definitely glad to have you here and you're welcome to stick around. But I do want to share that the intention of these videos is that they build upon one another. So to get the most out of this, you really want to go back to the first one and watch that and keep watching the other videos in successive order. Like I said, love to have you stick around, be here with us, watch this. But for you to make the most out of the information that's given, you really need to go back to the beginning and watch them together. So one way or another, let's, let's get rolling. So if you have been watching, then you know that the current series we're on is called The Signs of the Times. And what the signs of the times are, are the things that Jesus specifically noted would happen in the world prior to his return. And Jesus called those the signs of the times. Those aren't things that me or anybody else made up. And so far, we've looked at the signs that applied to the church. Okay, there were three big ones. One was the return of Israel as a nation. That was crucial for the end time calendar to kick off and begin. Because Israel definitely is in the book of Revelation. It's in the end times. So the fact that it wasn't around for 1900 years, it was really crucial that it get resurrected and make the return. All right. So the second one, make sure I remember all this. The second one was, um, third one was Daniel's timeline. Second one was uh, the church or God's people being resurrected after two days. Actually, it's Jesus being resurrected after two days. And that definitely applies to his first coming. But then scripture also tells us in Peter's accounts that a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day. So you can read that same scripture as Jesus being resurrected after 2,000 years. So it equally applies to his second coming as well as his first coming. Now, the third one was Daniel's timeline. I kind of look at the book of Daniel as the, the calendar for the Bible. And you look at the timeline events that the angel Gabriel jump-started with Daniel. So starting in Daniel's account all the way to the end until Jesus returned is this consecutive timeline that Gabriel lays out. And the 70th week is crucial because that is the time of the end. And it's a mystery, but we looked at it and figured out that within that one week of seven years, three and a half years occurred at the first coming of Jesus. That was the time frame of his ministry. There's three and a half years in the tribulation, which would be the end. Now, in the middle, there's 2,000 years of church history, which nobody thought of you know, happening. But now, historically, we certainly know that. But anyway, that accounts for that 70th week. So those are the times of the church and what we looked at. Last session, we looked at the Antichrist. That was certainly an eye opener. And I'm, I'm not quite sure what the right word is to describe these things that we're, we're going through. I don't know if exciting is the right word. I don't know if uh, intimidating is the right word. It's something. But I think it's definitely exciting that we are looking at the return of Jesus possibly being this generation, possibly being upon us. I also think that it's a little uh, disconcerting that the Bible has talked about that time in the end as being the worst time in the history of mankind. And it's just going to be awful and millions of people are going to lose their lives for their faith. So. Definitely, it's exciting. Definitely, we look at it with trepidation. But one way or another, it's going to happen. We just need to see how is God preparing us? What did God share with us in his word? How can we learn from it so we can survive to the end and see Jesus? So given that, we've got two more signs to look at for the bad guys. We looked at the Antichrist last time. This time, we're going to have to look at the false prophet and also the 10 kings who will arise with them. So with that, let's get going. All right. So as I said, we've already looked at the Antichrist. So the next two signs are the false prophet and the 10 kings from the east. And the kingdom of hell is referred to in uh, Revelation as the great city, just like God's people are looked at as the holy city. 
you can do a word study in Revelation, you can see that those two places are referring to the two kingdoms. So let's look at who the false prophet is, according to Scripture. So it says in Revelation 13, 11 through 15, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. So let's backtrack before we even get going on this. Remember that the beginning of Revelation 13 talked about the beast from the sea, right? And that his angelic name is Leviathan. That is the spirit being who will uh, dwell within the Antichrist. So now we're looking at the spirit being who will dwell within the false prophet, right? And these two guys are always seen together in scripture. In Job, they were seen as behemoth, the beast from the earth, and Leviathan, the beast from the sea. They're known as death and hell. They're known as the false prophet and the Antichrist. These two beings are always together. They're numbers two and three in the kingdom of hell, just beneath Lucifer. So let's look at the, the false prophet. It says, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. He exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence, and he makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose fatal wound was healed. He performs great signs so that even so that he even makes fire come down out of heaven to the earth in the presence of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs it was given him to perform in the presence of the beast telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who had the wound of the sword who has come to life. And it was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast would even speak and cause many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And he causes all, the small and the great, and the rich and the poor, and the free men and the slaves to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. And he provides that no one will be able to buy or to sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for the number is that of a man, and his number is 666. So I made a mistake there. It says to buy or to seek, but it really says to buy or to sell, and that's going to be crucial. Okay, so... Let's look at this a little more closely. So the beast coming up out of the earth. Well, if you go back to Job 40, 15 through 24, that is behemoth. And he comes just before the beast out of the sea named Leviathan. Next, it says, he makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast. So he is a spiritual leader. Okay, that is his realm. That is his dominion. Next, he even makes fire come down out of heaven. So he mimics and stands in opposition to Elijah. And I think both apply because Elijah is a figure who's meant to represent one of God's leaders in the tribulation. And we'll look more closely at that. So he stands in opposition to that figure. And then that means that Elijah would represent the spiritual leader within God's kingdom at that point. And he's mimicking what the prophet Elijah did, calling fire to come down out of heaven. He performs false miracles that look like those of the church. Next, says he deceives those who dwell on the earth. So definitely he is a false prophet. But that means he's going to look like a real prophet. He's going to have that appearance, but only those who are spiritually discerning are going to know the difference. Then he says, he tells those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast. Well, if you remember back in the book of Daniel, King Nebuchadnezzar had an image made for himself, of himself, or representing himself, that the children of God, the Jews, were supposed to worship, to give him worship. And of course, that's the famous story where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, oh, no, 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 we're not going to do that. But... This whole story is going to play out again. We're going to be faced with that same challenge that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego faced. And we're going to need to face it the exact same way. All right. Lastly, it says a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. So the false prophet's going to require that of the people on the earth. Well, this is a mockery of what's called the Jewish Teflon. If you go back to Deuteronomy 6.8, 
God commanded Moses to give the people of Israel, the children of Israel, his commandments, his principles. And he said, you're to teach these to your children, to each generation, you're to pass these down. You're going to have to bind them on your forehead and on your hand. Now, I don't know if God really intended it to physically happen. I think you're just making a strong point. Nonetheless, we know that the Jews did that. That was a sign that they carried the commandments and words of God on their forehead and on their hand. So the false prophet is going to require some form of that, but it'll be a mockery of what God called his people to do. So that is a picture of all the things that the false prophet is going to do during his reign, ministry, false ministry on the earth. All right, so we need to take a look at something. And that something is called the Catholic Church. Where did the Catholic Church come from? Well, let's take a look at that. And to do that, we got to go back to Job 41, 1 through 18. And we need to look at Leviathan, who is the beast from the sea, because there are some clues that are planted there about the Catholic Church. So in red, you know, it says, can you draw out Leviathan with a fish hook or press down his tongue with a cord? Can you put a rope in his nose or pierce his jaw with a hook? Will he make many supplications to you? Will he try to be peaceable with you is what that's saying. Or will he speak to you soft words? So he's going to falsely, you know, print, yeah, I'm going to play with you. We'll play nice with each other. Will he make a covenant with you? All right, so that word covenant, we need to take a closer look at that. we got to hang on to that word. So in Daniel, it says, Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. So we're referencing those words that Gabriel gave to Daniel about the 70 weeks. Okay, So this is, this is where this is coming from. And the people of the prince who is to come, so that's not Jesus, will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Remember, the holy city is God's people, and its end will come with a flood. If you go back to Revelation 13, it talks about this flood coming out of the dragon's mouth. Even to the end, there will be war, and desolations are determined, and he, he being the Antichrist, will make a covenant with the many for one week. That one week is the 70th week. And remember that 70th week, it's three and a half years of Jesus' ministry, 2,000 years of church history, and three and a half years during the tribulation. So a little over 2,000 years, that is the one week. So the covenant will be made with them during that time. So 70th week, first coming of Jesus, the 2,000 years of church history, and the second coming of Jesus. All right, so... We need to go back and look at the contest. It, like I said, if you have not watched the previous videos, you need to, because that's what's going to make sense of this. So the contest is between the children of God and the children of the enemy. So in Daniel 2.40, it says, Then there will be a fourth kingdom as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron crushes and shatters all things. So, like iron that breaks in pieces, it will crush and break all these in pieces. Now, if you go back and look at the, the words, you look at the rest of the book of Daniel, it talks about four kingdoms. The head of gold is Babylon. Scripture specifically says that. The chest of silver, those are the Medes and the Persians. Scripture specifically says that. And historically, that was true. The Babylonians were a massive empire. The Medes and the Persians came in and conquered them. Next up, was the the torso of bronze those were the greeks scripture specifically says that historically that was true the greeks came in and took over for the medes and the persians next up was the the empire of iron that was the roman empire who came in and then crushed all the rest of them took their place destroyed them they are the great empire of the enemy all right so what we're saying here is that the great, the great empire of the enemy is going to make friends with God's people. They're going to make a covenant with them. So the Edict of Milan, this was a historical thing that happened. It was proclaimed by the Roman emperors Constantine and Licinius, 
who bestowed tolerance for Christianity and other religions. This is a great watershed moment in the history of the church. And it's been seen as something that was great because prior to this, God's people have been persecuted. They've been lit up as Roman candles, meaning they were bound. They had, I don't know, linens or some oil poured on their heads and then lit on fire. Their burning bodies lit the night sky in Rome. So the Edict of Milan made peace between the Roman Empire and God's people so that Christianity can now be tolerated. It was looked upon as, you know, it's okay. And it was Emperor Constantine who did that. He made a covenant with God's people. Now, doesn't it seem weird that the last empire of the enemy, who scripture specifically says stands in opposition to the kingdom of God, all of a sudden makes a covenant, makes peace with God's people. And yet scripture said it would happen. So the Roman Empire Constantine made a covenant with the church in the year 313 AD. This covenant has lasted for the duration of the week. So that peace covenant he made has continued ever since then. This covenant led to the creation of the Catholic Church, which became the state religion of the Roman Empire. Now, again, this, this should set off bells and whistles in everybody's head that the stated enemy of the church is the one who birthed the Catholic Church. I, I shouldn't even have to explain that one. So Daniel described the Roman Empire as the enemy's last kingdom on earth. The abuses of the popes and the apostasies of the Catholic Church are well documented. This covenant, it actually stunted the growth of the original church, which later had to be reformed under Luther, right? So the, even though they were being persecuted, it's the underground persecuted church that has always been the most effective. It has always been the kingdom of God that's actually on the offensive. And because they're doing so well, that's why the enemy's persecuting them. But all of a sudden, we get soft when the persecution stops. And we see that under the Catholic Church, it, you know, we lost our way. We lost our way. We'll talk about that a little more in a little bit. So the Roman Empire moved, but its religious institution remains intact. And most people think the Roman Empire stopped, which we show that it didn't in our last video. But... So the Catholic Church definitely remains to this day. So it was actually, it was a master stroke by the enemy. Keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Because if you are the head of God's people and you're actually their enemy, how great is that? You can control everything going on. You can choose the narrative. And when you have time on your side, you can move subtly from generation to generation you can continue to move God's people farther and farther and farther away from what God's actually called his people to do. Like I said, it, it actually was a master stroke by our enemy. All right, so Revelation 17, 3 says, And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, full of blasphemous names, having seven heads and ten horns. And if you look at the context of this, which we'll do much more closely later, this is talking about the false religion at the end of times that the ant or the, the false prophet is in charge of. There's the political realm of the Antichrist, then there's the religious realm of the false prophet, and they certainly are in cahoots together. This is describing the false religion, and it's key that it says it has seven heads and ten horns. And it further says the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. This is straight from scripture, Revelation 17, 9. And if you know your history, that's Rome. Rome is a city very famously built on seven hills. These are the names of them. Uh, and I'm not going to butcher these by trying to go through it, but it's a very well-known concept. You can look it up yourself. It's a historical fact that Rome is famously built on these seven hills. Scripture specifically referencing that. 
All right, so this is a passage from Jeremiah 7, 18. So bear in mind everything we just talked about. This is a new piece. It says, the children gather wood and the fathers kindle the fire and the women need dough to make cakes, which would be bread for the king or for the queen of heaven. And they pour out drink offerings, right? Cup, cup of wine to other gods in order to spite me. So Jeremiah is calling out God's people because they are making uh, bread offerings and drink offerings of wine to false gods. And again, this should start to sound familiar to you. So this is a picture that's probably familiar to many if you grew up Catholic or if you're familiar with the Catholic Church. This is Mary, the mother of Jesus. And according to official Catholic Church doctrine, Mary has been officially designated the title Queen of Heaven. It says the Catholic teaching on this subject is expressed in the papal encyclical ad blah, 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 issued by Pope Pius XII in 1954. It states, Mary is called Queen of Heaven because her son, Jesus Christ, is the King of Israel and the heavenly King of the universe. Indeed, the Davidic tradition of Israel recognized the mother of the king as the queen mother of Israel. So, scripture, Jeremiah called this out over a couple thousand years ago, saying that this would happen. So Jeremiah 44, 17, 18. So this is much later in the book of Jeremiah, but he's still dealing with the same issue. So let's read this. It says, but rather, this is uh, the Jewish people talking, God's people, talking back to Jeremiah. But rather, we will certainly carry out every word that is proceeded from our mouths by burning sacrifices to the Queen of Heaven and pouring out drink offerings to her. So they're saying, we are going to do this. Telling Jeremiah, we don't care what you say, we're going to do this. It says, just as we ourselves our forefathers, our kings, and our princes did in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then we had plenty of food and were well off and saw no misfortune. So they're saying, we're going to continue to do what our leaders, what our people have done for generations. And in this case, with the Catholic Church, it's been done for 1,500 years. And it says, for then we had plenty of food and were well off and saw no misfortune. But since we stopped burning sacrifices of the Queen of Heaven and pouring out drink offerings to her, we have lacked everything and have met our end by the sword and by famine. So let's look at this. What they're saying is that, okay, Jeremiah, this is what we did for generations. We make bread, we made drink offerings of wine, and we gave those to the Queen of Heaven. We listened to you. We stopped doing it. And once we did that, everything fell apart. It says, then we lacked everything. And we met our end by the sword and by famine. So in other words, they were dying in their minds because they quit burning these sacrifices or quit giving these sacrifices to the Queen of Heaven. So update that now to our time. What Jeremiah is foretelling is that in the tribulation, the true prophet of God is going to tell the people, you can no longer burn those sacrifices, make those sacrifices to Mary, the mother of Jesus. You cannot give bread and wine to her. And apparently those people are going to listen for a bit, but then they're going to turn around and say, all right, but now we're facing persecution from the Antichrist and probably from the false prophet because we listen to you and we quit giving sacrifices, but now we're dying by the sword and by famine. Our lives are on the line because we're not doing that. We are now going to turn around and we are going to make those sacrifices again because basically we don't want to give up our lives for this. And it says in Jeremiah 44, 17 and 18, I looked and be, oh, I'm sorry. This is actually from Revelation. I've got the wrong the wrong scripture down. This is from Revelation 6, chapter 6. It says, I looked and behold an ashen horse, and he who sat on it had the name Death 
and Hades was falling with them. Remember, death and Hades are another name for behemoth and Leviathan, the false prophet and the Antichrist. Authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and by the wild beasts of the earth. All right, so it's the false prophet and the Antichrist who are going to oppress God's people if God's people don't do what they say and make those false sacrifices of the bread and the wine to the image of the Antichrist. See how this all fits together? Old Testament and New Testament support each other. Revelation 14, 9-12 says, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink of the wine of the wrath of God. So God's telling you straight up, okay, if you accept the mark of the beast, if you offer sacrifices to him if you give your allegiance to him you're going to face my wrath which is mixed in full strength in the cup of god's anger and he the people will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever no end to it and they have no rest day and night those who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. So God's telling us, his people, straight up, you are not to show your allegiance to the Antichrist. You are not to receive the mark on your forehead or hand. And I don't think that's a physical thing. I think it's a... Uh, um, an imagery thing, you're basically not to show your allegiance to the Antichrist, and you're definitely not to give uh, bread offerings and drink offerings. You are not to show your allegiance. God says, if you do, you're facing eternal torment, and the perseverance of the saints is those who refuse to give in to that. It's the exact opposite of the people that Jeremiah was talking about who didn't refuse. They said, all right, well, now we're losing our physical lives, so we're going to go back to giving these offerings. The perseverance of the saints, God's people are willing to sacrifice their physical lives, even to the point of death, if they can have eternal relationship with God and not face eternal torment. That is the perseverance of the saints. That is the choice that God's people are going to be given and that we have to be ready to face. Many in the Catholic Church will fall away and offer sacrifices to the Antichrist in order to avoid starvation and death. They will fail to demonstrate the perseverance of the saints as it talks about in Revelation 14, 12. So, Scripture seems to indicate that the false prophet will be the head of the Catholic Church, and we know this person as the Pope. So here's an interesting thing. This is called the prophecy of St. Malachi. And what it is, is Malachi was an Irish saint who lived from 1094 to 1148. The prophecy of Malachi was discovered in 1590. So the prophecies up to 1590 were incredibly accurate, amazingly so. After 1590, they got a little hazy. So I'm sure you can read between the lines here. If you go back and look, the prophecy of St. Malachi was a false prophecy from the very beginning. It was something that somebody wrote up to basically support a political candidate for the position of Pope. And I don't know how it all worked, but that's really what it was. So that's why all the prophecies before that looked incredibly accurate because, well, history already happened, so there's nothing prophetic about it. After that, there, there are some things that have happened that seem to bear witness to it, but overall, the, the level of accuracy is not even close to what it was before 1590. 1590 is when it was discovered. But here's the funny thing. Malachi prophesied, or prophesied that there would be 120 popes from his time forward. So again, if you look back, you know, the 1100s from the time of Malachi, who was a real person, right? So we have a beginning point. From his time forward, there are prophesied to be 120 popes. 
the prophecy for the 120th Pope says this, because there's a specific, each Pope, 100th, 111th, 115th, the 59th, the third, there's always a little thing that talks about what's going to happen during their reign. So for the 120th Pope, it says this, Peter the Roman, who will pasture his sheep in many tribulations, and when these things are finished, the city of seven hills will be destroyed. Rome, the picture of the, the Catholic Church, the false religion, okay? it says, and the dreadful judge will judge his people. Well, we know that's in Jesus. And he's only dreadful if you have something to, to go before him and be dreaded. If you've been faithful to Jesus, you have nothing to worry about. So this is the end. This is what the reign of the 120th Pope is meant to be. Now, here's the interesting part. The 120th Pope is Pope Gregory, the current Pope. What can you say? It's kind of like when you look at the picture of uh, Vladimir Putin that we looked at with the last session, and we see he is the spitting image of the first Caesar. Is the last Caesar going to look like that? Is this the last Pope? I can't answer that definitively. All I can share is this is what the information seems to be pointing us to. But again, remember, only God can really reveal what are the signs of the times to us. So we've looked at for the signs. We looked at the holy city. That's God's people. We've looked at the restoration of Israel. It's happened. We've looked at the revival uh, after two days. So certainly 2,000 years has gone by. And we've also looked at the 70th week and what that means. So for the great city who is the enemy, we've looked at the Antichrist and we've looked at the false prophet. So there's only one more set of signs that we want to look at. And those are the 10 kings from the East who are going to raise up with the Antichrist and the false prophet to reign with them. All right, one more time. We have the ability to discern the signs of our times. That's what scripture told us. That's what Jesus told us when he reigned or when he was here the first time. Also, we must discern the signs of our times to know if we are the last generation who will see the second coming of Christ. We need to do that because we need to be equipped. Scripture says that my people perish for lack of knowledge. We need to be equipped with the knowledge in order to persevere to the end and not give in to deception. We must ask God to reveal the signs to us. We need to have our Heavenly Father reveal to us what is truth so that we can act accordingly, so that we are willing to fulfill the perseverance of the saints. All right, so the last set of signs is about the 10 kings from the east. So let's go back to that last kingdom that scripture references in Daniel. After this, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrifying and extremely strong, and it had large iron teeth. It devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet. And it was different from all the beasts were before it, and it had 10 horns. This is Daniel 7.7. 7. Now, the, the statue that Daniel referenced, that Nebuchadnezzar had a dream about the statue. Daniel gave the interpretation and talked about the four different kingdoms who all represent the enemy, going down in succession. Babylon, Medes, Persians, Greeks, lastly the Romans. Well, the very last thing on that statue are the feet, and the very last thing on the feet are the toes, 10 toes. The last things to come up will be the 10 toes um, who are gonna be kings who are gonna reign with the Antichrist. Daniel 7, 19 through 26 says this, then I desired to know the exact meaning of the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, with its teeth of iron and its claws of bronze, which devoured, crushed, and trampled down the remainder with its feet. Feet. And the meaning of the ten horns that were on its head and the other horn which came up. 
and before which three of them fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth uttering great boasts and which was larger in appearance than its associates. So that great horn is the Antichrist. He is going to be one of the ten horns. We'll, we'll go into more depth on that later. Then the rest of the passage says, I kept looking, Daniel, and that horn was waging war with the saints and overpowering them until the ancient of days, Jesus, came and judgment was passed in favor of the saints of the highest one. And the time arrived when the saints took possession of the kingdom. Thus he said, the fourth beast will be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth and tread it down and crush it. As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom, ten kings will arise. So we see the interpretation of those ten horns. It's ten kings. The ten toes are the ten kings. They will arise, and another will rise after them. That's the big horn, or that's the little horn um, that's boast, boasting. That's the Antichrist. And he will be different from the previous ones. And subdue three kings. He will speak out against the Most High and wear down the saints of the highest one. And he will intend to make alterations in times and in law. And they will be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. And we know from before that's three and a half years. But the court will sit for judgment, and his dominion will be taken away, annihilated, and destroyed forever. So these ten kings says in uh, Revelation 13, 1, And the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. So that's Lucifer, you know, because Scripture says he's the dragon. Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. We know that that's Leviathan. Okay, that's the beast from the sea. Having ten horns and seven heads. Well, the seven heads, we know, refers to Rome, and it refers to the false religion. The ten horns are those ten kings. And on his horns were ten diadems. Those are crowns. So that's another sign that says these are ten kings. And on his heads were blasphemous names. Again, that's Revelation 13. Revelation 17, 12, and 13 says this. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings. So it's being very specific about this. Who have not yet received the kingdom. But they receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour. The beast from the sea, Leviathan, the Antichrist. These have one purpose, and they give their power and authority to the beast. And one hour is just another, again, time frames are, are spoken of differently in Scripture. We'll look at that later, but it's referencing the time of the tribulation in the last hour. All right, so... Ten kings who are going to arise are going to get their power from the Antichrist, and they're going to serve him. And the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her. So her is the false prophet. That's the false religion. And the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth of her sensuality. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river, the Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way would be prepared for the kings from the east, Revelation 16, 12. So not only is it saying that these kings are coming, but it says where they're coming from, from the east. So, signs of the times. This is a real thing right now. It says, all right, it talks about the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. It's called the SCO. You can look this up yourself online is a eurasian eastern comes from the east eurasia eurasian political economic international and defense organization established by russia and china in 2001 it is the world's largest regional organization in terms of geographic scope and population covering approximately 60% of the area of Eurasia and 40% of the world population. As of 2021, its combined GDP was around 20% of the global GDP. This is a powerful organization that meets yearly, if not more. Okay? It's called the SCO, you can look it up yourself, initiated by Russia and China. 
So the SEO currently has nine members, China, India, Iran, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Russia, Pakistan, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan, all from Eurasia, all from the East. Belarus has applied for membership and is expected to be accepted next year. And if you watch anything about the news, if you look at the, the war with Ukraine, Belarus is just a lackey of Russia. They basically have given their power, their authority uh, as a country over to Russia. This would be the 10th king from the east. It's just a formality. It's going to happen. The SEO will be 10 kings from the east. It is a formal organization of countries that basically communally acts uh, economically and politically. Those are your 10 kings from the East. All right, so signs of the times. We've looked at three for God's people, the holy city, the restoration of Israel, Jesus revival after two days and the 70th week. We've now looked at the great city, the antichrist, the false prophet, and the 10 kings from the East. So we have the ability to discern the signs of the times. That's what we're trying our best to do. We're trying to do this to the best of our ability right now. We must discern the signs of our times to know if we are the last generation who will see the second coming of Christ. If we're not the last generation, then this stuff doesn't matter. If we are intended to be the last generation, then the signs of the times should tell us that that is the case. But the only way we're going to be able to accurately discern that is if God reveals it to us. So we need to be on our knees in prayer asking, God, is this truth? Are we the last generation? Do the signs of the times point to this being the time of the end? And therefore, we need to prepare ourselves for the persecution and the tribulation that lies ahead before Jesus returns. All right, so like I said, I'm not sure how to define what we're doing. I don't know if it's exciting. I don't know if it's exhilarating. I don't know if it's depressing, alarming. I think it's probably a combination of all of these above. But what I do know is that God will never leave his people hanging. He's never going to allow us to go things without doing it with us, without preparing us, without adequately equipping us to face whatever the trials and tribulations are that are going to go before us. So again, I ask everybody to be on your knees in prayer and ask God to reveal what are the signs of our times. So it's, it's an honor to go through God's word with God's people. We're going to keep doing this next week. What we're going to talk about is how do we know truth? Because the stuff I'm sharing with you guys, it's not like I'm the only one doing this. It's not like this hasn't been, these discussions haven't been happening for a while now. The whole idea of the return of Jesus, it kind of got kickstarted back in the 70s. And it's been going as an industry ever since. I don't want to be part of an industry. I want to be faithful to God. But you need to know how do we define what truth is? And you're going to need to test me as well as you test anybody else who's trying to share this information. So as always, we're going to go back and see what does God's word have to say. God bless. Take care.